2015 as a result of that motion. We turn now to topical questions. And the first question is from Murda Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To uh, ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with NHS Tayside regarding staff numbers and future workforce planning. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. As with all NHS boards, Tayside works to plan effectively to ensure patient safety with the right staff and right skills are where they are needed. In doing this, I have been clear with all boards that I will not accept changes that impact negatively on patient accessibility to care. I spoke yesterday to the chair of NHS Tayside, who reiterated his concern at how work to develop long-term plans has been portrayed. He has also been clear that as they plan improvements to accessibility, quality and delivery across all their services to meet current and future demand, they will not reduce capacity. Murdo Fraser. Can, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response? I'm sure she will appreciate the public concern there has been around reports that NHS Tayside are looking to shed 1,300 jobs or 10% of the workforce. We've already seen temporary closures in the minor injuries units in Pitlochry and Creef due to uh, shortages of nurses. The RCN have been in contact with my office this morning, expressing concern at a reduction in the headcount of nursing and midwifery staff in NHS Tayside over the last four years. I hear what she has to say about protecting frontline services, but surely with that level of a reduction in staff, it is not inevitable there will be some impact on already stretched uh, front-facing services. Cabinet Secretary. But there is no agreed level of reduction in staff. There is no agreed level of any reduction in staff. What we are dealing with here is subcommittee minutes to a board which simply noted them. No decisions have been taken. What is happening is the NHS Tayside doing precisely what we want them to do, as with other boards, is plan their use of resource, plan their service delivery with their health and social care partners, with their unions and their clinicians, exactly the right approach, exactly indeed uh, the contrary to what uh, uh, Mr Fraser's colleagues have accused us of not doing, where they've accused us of not planning for the future. That is what Tayside is doing. In doing that, they look at all options but they do that within the overall context of improving accessibility, quality and delivery of care. And I have been clear. So, yes, I do understand public concern, but I understand public concern fueled by reporting based on false assertions. That if those who had made those assertions had taken the trouble to know our health service as well as they think they do and to check the facts, they perhaps would not have made such irresponsible assertions in the first place. Murder Fraser. Can I thank the, the Cabinet Secretary for that further response? She talks about false assertions, but the figure that was put out there of 1,300 jobs or 10% of workforce was derived from minutes produced by NHS Tayside themselves. There's been nothing in any public statement issued by the Health Board since this appeared in the public domain on Sunday denying that level of reduction. So can she tell us, if it's not 1,300 jobs or 10%, what is it? Cabinet Secretary. Mr Fraser, you know better than this. You really do know better than this. You know as well as I do that when you are looking at how you will configure your services across a whole board area, far less the whole of Scotland, you look at all the options available. And in doing that, you begin to gather the data about how you stand compared to what other boards are doing. That is what that minute from that subcommittee reflects. So I am not going to either confirm 1300, I am certainly going to confirm that we will not have compulsory redundancies, we will not have changes in our health service that removes capacity. And when I talk about not removing capacity, you need staff to deliver capacity. I would have thought that was self-evident. Capacity isn't about buildings, it's about the people who deliver the service. Now, if you want to plan and look ahead properly, you do it in the following way. You gather the data, you look at what your demand is, what your patient cohort needs now and in the future as best as you project it. You look at where your services are, you map one over the other and you look at how you need to make changes to redeploy the use of those services. That is precisely what Tayside is doing. And they are not assisted 
by assertions that are factually incorrect because there is no agreement to cut any staff in Tayside. The NHS chair and I could not be clearer than that. So actually what we need to do is understand how these matters happen and if we've got concerns, absolutely raise them, but raise them on the basis of actually understanding how our health service works and not on the basis of looking for cheap headlines and scoring political points. That does no one any service whatsoever. Just for information, uh, there are six members who would like to get in. I'm not sure I'll get through them all, but uh, Emma Harper to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, President Officer. I remind Chamber that I do have an interest as a former frontline staff nurse. I welcome NHS Tayside's commitment to review how to most efficiently make use of taxpayers' funding. However, I can understand that the press coverage of the report may make some NHS Tayside staff feel uneasy. For the benefit of doubt, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to yet again confirm that the Scottish Government's policy of no compulsory redundancies remains firmly in place? Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, it absolutely does. And both I and the chair of, of uh, Tayside have confirmed that. What we are looking at here is how to deploy, best deploy the staff resource that we have in NHS Tayside and elsewhere in order to meet current and future demand across a whole system, which includes health and social care, as well as acute and, and secondary care in our health service. Monica Lennon to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When I read the Herald on Sunday report, it was quite clear to me that the NHS Tayside were confirming the, the nature of the, the story. The Cabinet Secretary's remarks will have caused further distress to hardworking staff in NHS Tayside. She may be aware that last year there were 35,000 stress-related sick days in Tayside. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, notwithstanding this very serious report in the Herald on Sunday, what discussion has she had with NHS staff unions about the working conditions at Tayside and about these very worrying plans. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can we just be clear that the worrying report in the Sunday papers probably came from the news release from Scottish Labour, mm -hmm. which talks about a recipe for disaster that would risk patient safety. What sloganising nonsense based on little except subcommittee minutes about looking at options precisely as I described to Mr Fraser. Can I get to the point of the question? But it has to be clear, let's not blame our press for how it covers news releases that come out in that language and in those terms. In terms of stress-related absence, I take that matter very seriously. That was part of the discussion I had with Mr Brown yesterday, and it will, will continue to be the discussion that I have with all the health board chairs and that we pick up with our chief executives. It's also part of what I am raising as I do ministerial reviews when I talk in some detail with the partnership forums in each of our boards talking to them about the issues that concern them, but also about the issues that I want to raise with them, which includes absence, staff absence, and what more we can do to assist them in the work that they do as members of unions uh, and also as employee directors. So I take it very seriously, and we continue those discussions and look to see what more we might do to assist our staff. Mark Roskill to be followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you. Members would have received a statement from the chairman of NHS Tayside uh, where he says, and I quote, that he wants the public to know that any changes to our services and staffing will only be made if they enhance our capacity and improve quality of health care. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of any comparable health board that has made a similar uh, level of workforce reduction but still managed to support and protect its capacity and the quality of its services? And if it has managed to do that, then how did it do it? Cabinet Secretary. Um, um, thank you, Mr Ruskell, for that question. Let me say again, NHS Tayside have not made any level of staff reduction. What they have done, and I am also now quoting from Mr Brown's statement, at this early stage of the programme, the programme is called Transforming Tayside, it is important that, as well as looking at how and where health and care services are delivered, we start to consider where staff are best placed to respond to the needs of all our patients and service users. That is precisely what he is doing, and we will support him and his board and other boards in doing that because we need them to look at not only what are they delivering now, but how sustainable and appropriate are those services across the whole system for the future. 
Willie Rennie. The cabinet, um, cabinet secretary describes this committee as a subcommittee, but I've no doubt this subcommittee has got some very important and informed people on it. And the fact that they are discussing this level of reduction, I think, reveals the real problem that exist within the NHS, certainly in Tayside. So what I'd like to understand is, although she says no decisions have been made, what is the process? When will conclusions be reached? Because I think this parliament has got a right to know when that will be done. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Mr Rennie is absolutely correct. The subcommittee does have uh, informed uh, members. Um, and indeed, the Transforming Tayside programme, which Mr Brown refers to, involves directly work with trade union colleagues, managers and lead doctors and nurses. So they have some very uh, well-informed and experienced individuals involved in that programme, which, as I have said before, is at an early stage. In terms of whatever conclusions they then reach as a board, those would be, if they are major changes, or if I consider them to be major changes, uh, are referred to me for decision. Uh, at this point, it is not uh, clear yet from the board exactly how long they think they will want to take before they reach final conclusions, because they began the work before I published the medium-term financial framework, uh, giving boards uh, not only relief from paying back brokerage, but a three-year financial planning cycle, and the waiting times improvement plan, which produces, as members will recall, uh, significant additional investment. And so the board will now need to recast some of their work in light of those significant enhancements to the context in which they're working and consider how they go forward from there. I'm sure they will provide me with a timetable of what they uh, expect to be doing over the coming uh, months, and I'd be happy to share that with Mr Rennie and other members. Thank you. Apologies to Fulton McGregor and Jenny Mara as we don't have enough time for any further supplementaries. Question number two, Daniel Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to protect emergency workers during the fireworks season in light of the reported increase in levels of violence and intimidation that they face at this time of year. Minister Ashton. The Scottish Government will not tolerate any attacks on our emergency services and a number of legal protections are in place, including the Emergency Workers Scotland Act of 2005. Powers available through antisocial behaviour legislation have been effectively used as part of the multi-agency approach to planning and also to prevention. But I am aware of some reports of antisocial behaviour and attacks on emergency services this year and recognise the impact this has not only on emergency service personnel, but also on the communities that are affected. But we are awaiting a full response from Police Scotland at this time. But I'm sure the Chamber will join me in extending my formal thanks and recognition to our emergency services following their busiest night of the year. Daniel Johnson. Um, I thank the, the Minister for that response, and I too would thank the emergency services for the work that they do. Firefighters, rather than running from danger, run to it. So the very fact that people would use the event of firework night to draw in fire, uh, firefighters and uh, other members will be concerned, as I was, to read reports over the weekend of watch managers describing war zone type situations with projectiles and fireworks being thrown at firefighters. Uh, well, other members will have found that deeply disturbing. And therefore, I'm alarmed that there is a need for a campaign at all. Um, so I'd wonder if the uh, Minister would join me in welcoming the fire services Don't Attack Me campaign. And I would also ask what steps the Scottish Government is taking to follow that campaign up. And I was also hoping that the Minister might be able to share initial reports from last night and what level of uh, violence and intimidation fire, the fire service faced uh, uh, with last night's festiv uh, festivities. Minister. I am aware of the Don't Attack Me campaign, obviously, and um, you know, very good work has been done uh, as a result of that. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, the, we don't have the full data from last night. It's too early. The agencies are still um, putting together the numbers. Um, the actual number of incidents last night is still yet to be confirmed. But at this stage, there is no suggestion of a significant increase. So I hope that will reassure the member on that point. Um, Antisocial behaviour, unfortunately, does occur year round and there are a range of powers and measures available to the police and local agencies to direct and disperse. Um, there has been a lot of multi-agency working um, 
uh, going on this year in both planning and prevention. I've been to see um, the work that's been undertaken in Edinburgh um, this year and I was very impressed by the level of, of working together and also um, the different range of measures that they had um, chosen um, to use this year and I think um, you know, that has meant um, different levels of planning were involved. Um, I think it has been good and I commend everybody that's been involved in that. Um, we will work with Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and also Police Scotland to review the events of last night and consider any lessons to be learnt. Daniel Johnson. Um, I thank the, the Minister for that response and I, I do hope that those early reports are correct, that there was a reduced level of violence. <laughs> and I'm also pleased that the Minister raised uh, the, the Emergency Workers Act of 2015, which is, of course was a, 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 an act that was passed by the last Labour administration in this place. It has secured over 8,000 convictions with around 800 convictions per year, with individuals uh, who are charged and found guilty receiving up to 12 months or £10,000 fine or both. And indeed, I was pleased that the Scottish Government extended that to GPs and community midwives. So could I ask if the Minister would agree with me that this is firstly useful legislation, but most importantly, that those who protect us, those who we ask to uphold the law, should uh, enjoy the protection of the law and that specific offences such as these are a vital tool in terms of extending that protection? Minister. I would agree with that, and I do. So there are specific laws in place to protect emergency workers, as the member has mentioned, through the Emergency Workers Act, Scotland 2005. In 2008, this administration extended the Emergency Workers Act to cover GPs, to cover other doctors, nurses and midwives when they are working in the community. Penalties are available to the courts all the way up to life imprisonment and unlimited fines to deal with the most serious assaults. This gives the police, prosecutors and courts the tools to ensure that those who attack public-facing workers are dealt with appropriately and effectively. Thank you, and I'm going to have to apologise again to both uh, Liam Kerr and George Adam. Uh, just remind all members and ministers, keep your questions concise, please, and we'll have more room for other members to get in. We'll move on now to uh, the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 14621 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville on the impact of UK government welfare cuts and universal credit on poverty. I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. <laughs> 